Well, hello everyone and welcome to the College Funding Solutions online presentation. I'm John Bork and I want to start by telling you that the reason that I'm engaged in college planning and the reason that I'm passionate about it is that I've seen firsthand that the biggest financial challenge that most families face is paying for their child's education while sacrificing the, their retirement. Well, it doesn't have to be that way. So I wanna help you and your child get the best education that you can for the best possible price. So for watching this presentation today, you have the opportunity to apply for our Visionary Scholarship Program, and that is through the American College Foundation. Now you can find their website at americancollegefoundation.org and apply online. To give you a little bit more background on the ACF itself, they're headquartered in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and their mission is to make college a reality for all students. Now, the way they do that is through their scholarship, and that requires three things. You have to, one, fill out the application. Number two, your student needs to write a 500-word essay on why they want to attend college. And number three, you need to submit an unofficial high school transcript. The second way the ACF makes college reality is through their free membership, their free website membership. Now, if you're a do-it-yourselfer and you want to navigate the process on your own, there's a number of resources that you can utilize to do just that. And the third way is by connecting families to trusted resources like myself and College Funding Solutions. All right, so to give you a little bit of background on who I am and why I care about education, I graduated from Texas Tech University with a 3.2 GPA and a major in journalism and history. My mother was a tremendous influence, and her background was in education as a high school teacher. She was also the Texas State Advisor for the Future Business Leaders of America, which is better known as FBLA. And when she passed away, our family started a memorial scholarship to honor her memory. After earning my degree, I enjoyed a 25-year broadcasting career, and my passion in that was really storytelling. After that, from there, I started the Raising a Champion podcast that focuses on youth sports, how to be a better sports parent, and how to create a better sports environment for our kids. And now, as a certified college advisor, I created my website, The Smart College Advisor, helping families like yours navigate this very in-depth process. All right, so I have partnered with College Funding Solutions, who I believe is the industry leader in late stage college planning. In other words, preparing for college at the high school level. Now, CFS was founded in 1993. They were incorporated in 1998, headquartered in Salem, Oregon. They have helped tens of thousands of families over that time. We have an A rating by the Better Business Bureau, where we have received numerous Business of the Year nominations. Our president and executive uh, director is Coy Howe, who has also written the book, College for Money. He is an, considered an industry insider. All right, you're gonna learn today that effective college planning, if done the right way, has three very key components. There's an academic piece, there's a social one, and there is a financial. My area of expertise is on the financial side. By partnering with College Funding Solutions, we help clients on the academic and the social sides of this process, because if we're really going to do a good job for you, we need to address all three of those concerns. All right, students, over 50% of the kids who start college do not get their degree, and I'm not trying to scare you with that. I just want to let you know that realistically, what it's like out there. Now, the biggest reason that students drop out is a lack of funding. The second reason is changing schools and the third is changing majors. Now, if you think about it, students, what happens when you change schools and you change majors? It costs more money, right? So really a lot of it ends up falling back to a lack of funding. Now, right now, according to the Department of Education, the average student takes about five and a half years to get their bachelor's degree. It's about 5.74. So outside of a lack of funding, when it takes this long, oftentimes students are unmotivated, they become complacent, and they quit. Of course, we want to avoid both of those circumstances. 
Well, with the families that we work with, over 85% of our kids graduate. In fact, for the last year, our graduation rate was 86%. The kids in our program graduate on average in four and a half years versus the national average of five and a half. So if the only thing I was able to do for you and your family was getting your child in and out of school a year quicker and with an 86% rate of graduating compared to that of 52%, what would that be worth to you? All right, now there's a couple of reasons why we have been so successful. Number one, and not to sound arrogant, but we don't work with everybody. So if you're not sure if college is for you, then to be honest, our program probably is not gonna be a good fit because this is gonna take some time and some effort on the student's part. But if you know that you're committed to getting your degree, and if you know that college is important to you and it's a high priority, then the information that you're gonna learn in this presentation and the resources that we can provide you with can have a huge impact on the type of education that you get and what you'll have to spend. Now, the other reason we're so successful at this is because of our experience. We've been doing this a long time. College Funding Solutions has been in college planning now for 30 years. We've worked with tens of thousands of families across the country. It is what we do full time and it's what CFS does day in and day out. All right, there are three things that we need to make sure that we all understand about an education. The first one is that it's essential. And think about all the specialized professions out there. Uh, you have to have a bachelor's degree and in many cases, a master's or even a doctorate degree. On average, a student with a college degree will make twice as much money over their lifetime as a student with just a high school diploma. Now that's according to the census. A student with a degree from a tier one college on average will make eight times as much money over their lifetime as someone who just has a high school diploma. So you have to have it be competitive in the marketplace. The second thing that you need to understand about college is that it is expensive. It was, if it was cheap and you could just write a check for the whole education and then forget about it, then you would be doing something certainly more fun than this. So I wanna be sure that you have a realistic expectation of what it's like now to send your kids to school. A four-year degree will cost you somewhere between eighty dollars and $250,000. Now, if you're considering law or even medical school, you can expect to pay over $400,000 by the time you get in and get out. So if you've had it, uh, have a chance, take a look at the handouts that I had you print up. Uh, if you don't have that yet, you can get that. There's a link to it right above uh, this presentation. And with that, turn to page two. A lot of these are schools you've, you're probably considering. I've also included the annual costs from a couple of tier one colleges from around the country. Those figures are the annual costs. So this includes everything. It's your tuition, your fees, it's your books, it's room and board, it's lab costs, it's the whole nine yards. So when you take a look at these, Temple is gonna run you around 55,000. Villanova and Drexel are over 80,000. Penn State, uh, right now is around 50,000. LaSalle comes in at over 75,000. You look at uh, U of D, Delaware, Rowan, and New Jersey, you see the in-state and the out-of-state figures, and it's a significant difference uh, for out-of-state uh, for those who want to go to those particular schools. As for some of those tier one schools, Duke, Stanford, Harvard, Princeton, all around $80,000. Now, the reality is students and parents, if you have the ability and the desire to get in and go to that type of school. A lot of times when it's all said and done, the out-of-pocket cost to go to a tier one school really won't be much higher than those other schools. And I know it's really hard to get your head around and you're saying, wait a minute, the sticker price is three times, four times higher than some of these other schools. You don't have to pay sticker price. That's the key. When you purchase a new car, and I like to use this analogy, the new car or even a used car, do you ever pay sticker price? No, and I think even if you did, you probably wouldn't admit it, right? So it's the same thing with the college education. You don't have to pay sticker price. And the great thing about these schools with the bigger sticker price is that they usually have more money to play with. Now, I'm not saying that every student should go to an $80,000 per year private school. For some of you, the local state, uh, state school, local state university, is the absolute best fit for you. But 
If you have the ability and you have the desire to get into one of these schools, don't let the price tag scare you away. Let's go through the process. Let's see what that school will offer. Let's compare apples to apples. Then you can make an informed decision. The other thing with these schools, with these uh, bigger sticker prices, you know, we talked about the average length of time it takes a student five and a half years to graduate. Well, a lot of these colleges will guarantee that they can get you in and out in four years. And your state college won't make that guarantee to you. All right, that leads us into our last point, and that is that college is a business. And I wish I had known this when I went to college. In fact, it is big business and it's a well-oiled machine. In fact, I spoke with a former admissions officer recently, and he said that he could sit down with a family, and after answering about a 15-minute questionnaire, he knew within a few thousand dollars how much that family would pay to attend his school. Now, one of the things I'm going to be sharing with you is not only helping you to get into a position to get the best offer, but also how you can go back and appeal that offer and try to negotiate for more money from the college. When I went to college, I didn't even know that you could do that. In fact, most people today still don't know you can go back and appeal an award letter. So to recap, college is essential, it's expensive, and it's a business. All right, students. Some questions that you should be asking, not just students, but parents as well. You know, have your counselors at your school talked to you about how to position yourself to appeal a financial aid off? I would say 98% won't. And I'm not knocking your counselors. They're overworked and underpaid. There's just 100 different items that they don't have time to address with you and to help you with this. Other questions. What happens if I contribute to my 401k or my IRA while my kid is in high school? It has an impact. How much can my child earn before it impacts their financial aid eligibility? That's a number that changes every single year. What funding strategy should be implemented before the base year begins? How do you position yourself to appeal a financial aid offer? We can help with that. What is the most overlooked part of an admissions application? Letters of recommendation. I can come up with 10 to 15 more questions, but I think you get the idea. Just knowing this kind of information is going to give you a big advantage as you go through the process. All right, here's your keys to success. Number one, complete understanding of the process. How do all the pieces fit together? Why is career planning important when paying for college? Why does a good SAT or, SA or ACT test score matter? Not only getting into college, but how much you're going to spend. We'll help you do that. Number two, you want to start early. If there's one thing I can get across to you in listening to this, it's starting early, all right? You wanna be at the front of the line. Financial aid is first come, first serve. The earlier you get in line, everything else being equal, the more money that you're going to receive. Number three, effective career planning. Truly starts with effective college planning. The two go hand in hand. It's an eight to 10 year process. And we start that out by doing a personality and an aptitude test, kind of a, uh, a Myers-Briggs test, if you're familiar with that. So we want to help the students identify their interests, their abilities, and their values. What fields of study fit those interests, those abilities, and those values? Uh, and as you're exposed to new classes and new experiences, some of those interests and abilities, abilities are going to change. So if you start early in the process, you can go back and reevaluate. Don't you think you'll probably make better decisions on your career planning? And I think you can probably see why the kids that start the process earlier have such a big edge, a big advantage, uh, even in career planning. So once you have a field of study in mind, then the college search and the selection process begins. And with that, you're going to want to find the colleges that are the best fit for you. And you notice I said colleges plural because the worst thing that you can do throughout all of this is to get tunnel vision on just one school. Again. We said college is a business, just like any other business. If they know they don't have any competition, do they have any motivation to give you any money? Absolutely not. So to go back to that car analogy, would you go to the car lot, sit behind the wheel and say, I'm dying to have this. I love this car. I got to have this one. Got to have it today. And I'm not going to shop around at any other dealers. I want it now. Would you please give me a good deal? Well, I certainly hope you wouldn't do that because that's how many families, that's what families do when they pay for their college. It doesn't make any sense. So we want to help you find six to eight colleges 
that would all be a really good fit for you. And that way, no matter which one gives you the best offer, you know you're, you know you're going to be happy and you're going to be comfortable going to one of those schools. So what are you guys looking for in a school? Do you want to go to a big school? Do you want to go to a small school? 25,000 kids or less. Do you want to stay close to home? Do you want to go far away? Uh, do you want a school in an urban setting or do you want to go in more of a rural uh, area? Extracurricular activities. Do you like the outdoors? You know, these are all things to really consider. And those these are all things that we will help you sort out as you go through the process. All right. One of the things that we ask you to look at is there's a couple of things and, and, and probably some uh, uh, analytics that you haven't even remotely considered. But one of them is called the yield. And what is the yield? Well, that's the number of students who were offered admission that actually end up attending. I think you probably have all heard the conversion rate or the acceptance rate. That's a number I think a lot of people get stuck with. But a yield is something that can definitely help you. So, for example, let's say that Penn State admitted 24,000 students for their freshman class next year. Out of that 24,000, 8,000 actually enrolled at Penn State. So what is the yield? 8,000 and 24,000, 33%. And that's typical of, of Penn State. Why is that important? Well, we look at this because it gives us an idea of how tough the school will be to negotiate when it's time to appeal that offer. Uh, why do we look at that? Why does that matter? Remember, college is a business. So if the college has a lower yield, it means they're having a tougher time filling the seats. And that means that we're probably going to have more success negotiating with them for more money, especially if I can find a college that has a lot of money to play with and a low yield. For an example of that, or a couple of examples, down at the bottom, you see Lehigh and Bucknell, two excellent colleges, but it's almost as, as expensive to go there as other tier one schools. So what do you think that Lehigh and Bucknell typically have to do to attract a kid that could get into a tier one school. They have to discount the price and they're going to offer more money. Both Lehigh and Bucknell have a pretty low yield. It's in the 20% so that we know if we get a kid that gets into Lehigh or Bucknell, when it comes time to negotiate and appeal the offer, we're probably going to get more money for them. So if we can help you find some of those values, it can definitely have a big impact in your choice. Another thing that we want to look at is the student loan default rate. So if I'm working with a family and they have several offers from colleges and the financial aid offers are, you know, are, are similar, but one of those colleges has a student loan default rate that's twice as high as the others, what does that tell us? Well, one of two things. Either they have more debt on average when they graduate, and that's not good, or they're having a tougher time finding jobs. And I know one of the biggest reasons that you want to go to college the type of money you want to make, the type of career that you want to have. So we want to put you into a situation where you can be competitive. Now, at the end of the day, they're hiring the applicant, not the college, right? So I don't want to make it sound like just because you have a degree from a certain school that you're guaranteed success for the rest of your life. But there are certainly some schools and some programs that are going to give you a more competitive position than others. Again, Take a look at it, yield, student loan default rate. These are statistics that probably don't have a lot of sizzle to them. You probably never even heard of them prior to this video, but I think you can probably see that how knowing this and how they all work together has a big, big impact on finding the right school, the right major, and stuff like that. All right, for the rest of the time that we have, we're gonna be talking about the funding because I know that's the biggest concern that most families face. There are two types of funding. There's gift aid, which is what it sounds like. It's a gift. It's free money. They can call it a lot of things, a scholarship, a grant, an endowment, tuition waiver, a tuition reduction. Bottom line is you don't have to pay it back. The other type of funding is self-help aid. And there are two types of self-help aid. You got money that you have to work for, like a federal work study program. And then there's money that you have to pay back, such as a student loan or even a parent loan. For those two types of funding, there are three general sources. You got the government, and that can be both the federal government and some states. There are state grant programs as well, the colleges themselves, and the private sector. All right, so let's first talk about the government. 
Now, before you're eligible for any federal student loan programs, any federal grant programs, you have to fill out a form called the FAFSA. The FAFSA stands for Free Application for Federal Student Aid. You can file it beginning October 1st of your senior year. Now, I'm not trying to scare you with the FAFSA, mom and dad, but millions of families file it on their own every year. You can file it on your own, but the Department of Education estimates that 80% of FAFSA submitted each year contain mistakes or errors. Now, it might be an error that won't make a big difference, or it could be a mistake that costs you thousands of dollars that you did not have to pay just because you did the form wrong. So knowing how to complete these forms and the FAFSA, and it's changed, recently it's changed starting in 2023, and it's a little more confusing, but to complete them correctly is very crucial, very important. So if we're working with you, we will give you a line-by-line -line answer sheet and, fill, and filing instructions for your FAFSA. So you're gonna know exactly how to fill it out. You're gonna know all the correct answers. We do that for a couple of reasons. Number one, it takes a lot of headaches and stress and worry off of mom and dad. Number two, we know what's right the first time. The other thing that we will do is that we'll make sure that you have that answer key before October 1st, because we want you to file it on October 1st, if at all possible. Now, in 2023, that date was delayed. We expect that it's gonna resume be October 1st. Whenever that window opens, you're gonna have the answers ready to go. Because I said this a few minutes ago, and I'm gonna repeat it, financial aid is first come, first serve. So the earlier we can get you in line, the more money you are going to receive. Now, the other reason that we wanna help you with that is that there's strategies behind that form that can have a big impact on what you end up paying or having to pay out of pocket. It's a lot like your tax return, right? It's not how you fill it out at the end of the year that really makes the difference. It's the planning that you did the year before. Well, same thing with the FAFSA. All right, after you file your FAFSA, you're gonna receive a student aid report. And this is a, essentially the breakdown of it. Cost of attendance, minus student aid index, or what used to be your expected family contribution, your ESC, equals your financial need. It's now called student aid index, so the SAI is what you're gonna need to know. I've seen families that make as much as $300,000 receive a significant amount of financial need because they took advantage of some of the funding strategies that are out there. So if you're working with us, you'll have the peace of mind to know that your SAI is as low as it can possibly be possibly be we didn't miss anything we have to show the colleges that you won't get any government money to entice them to give you some of theirs so even if you don't take government money we have to put the colleges on notice that you're serious about this and that you want the best offer that you can get all right once your fafsa has been filed they'll send you back a report as i said i mentioned it's called the student aid report there's a couple of key parts of of information on this and one of them is the SAI you'll see it up in the right hand corner now this is the EFC back before the change and I'm going to show you a couple of examples of some families who filed their FAFSA on their own they did it themselves uh, they filed it it was processed they didn't get any sort of a notification it was wrong and then we started work, working with a younger student same family so as we started working with the younger student mom and dad said hey we already filed the FAFSA for our older kid would you take a look at it for us? We took, we took a look at it, we noticed some mistakes, we helped them amend it. So the reason that I wanna point that out is, is for our clients, if we start working for you, you won't have a before and after because we're gonna do it right the first time. So that's kind of how these examples came to be. Now on this particular form, you're gonna see that the first expected family contribution was 19,344. We helped to amend their FAFSA, we had to refile it. You can see the EFC is now just over $12,000. So for that particular family, that's about $7,000 a year in additional eligibility over a four-year education. It's about $28,000 in additional eligibility for that family alone. All right, let's take a look at another one. Similar situation, filed their FAFSA. It was processed. It was accepted. No one came back, notified them that anything was wrong. Uh, their before EFC was 7,300. We went back as we were working with one of the younger students, made corrections, 
They amended it. Their second EFC was just under $3,000. So for them, that was a $4,400 difference per year over a four-year education. You're looking at over $17,000 of additional eligibility. Now, again, I can't promise you, mom and dad, that we're going to lower your EFC by that much, but you will know that it is as low as it can possibly be. And you're going to know that we didn't miss anything and you didn't miss any steps because you'll know that you're getting a fair shake when we fill this out and help you fill it out for you. All right, we've talked about the government money and the FAFSA. Let's talk about getting money from the colleges. The colleges are the largest source of gift aid. And for our clients, this is where most of the money is going to come from. Now, one of the first things that you need to do is make yourself an attractive student. We can talk about all the strategies in the world here, but if you've got a 2.0 GPA, low test scores, you're not going to get any money from the colleges unless you're an amazing athlete, have great musical talent, or something like that. As far as merit-based money, you're not going to get any if you have the low grades, low test scores. And I'm not saying you have to be the valedictorian, and I'm not saying you have to have a 4.0 GPA. But I am saying is that you need to do the best that you can in the classroom. Students, I'm going to treat you like an adult here. And I know the teenagers in my life want to be treated like an adult, so I'm going to give it to you straight. If you're not taking care of business in the classroom, kind of all this other stuff that we're talking about is not going to really do a whole lot for you. So you need to work hard in the classroom and always give it at your best. Second thing that you need to do is you need to keep your options open. Like I said before, don't get tunnel vision. It's okay to have a favorite. And I know some of you already have a favorite right now, what school you want to go to. Don't let the colleges know that. Don't let them know you're dying to get in. What's going to happen, students, is that in the spring of your senior year, after you filed your FAFSA, after you've applied to the colleges you're going to apply to, you're going to start getting award letters from those colleges. That award letter is going to do a couple of things. Number one, it's going to show you the total cost of this school. It's going to show you how much financial aid they're offering you to get you to attend. So if you're working with us, when you get those award letters, we want you to send them to us so we can help you evaluate them. Because realistically, you really don't know if you're getting a good deal or not. And you can't compare one college to a different college. You really have to compare the college to itself. In other words, what does that college normally do for a family in our financial situation with your academic strengths? Well, I can tell you that that information is not just floating around out there on the Internet. We spend a lot of money on that data to help be able to provide that information to our clients. So for about 90 percent of the colleges in this country, we can tell you what their average offer is going to be based on your financial situation and your academic strength. So when you get those award letters, bring them to us. We're going to help you evaluate them and then we're going to help you appeal the offer. So, all right, do me a favor. Take those handouts again that you printed up. I'll show you a couple of examples of what we're talking about. All right, we're going to look at the award money, and I'm going to focus on just the free money. So the first one is, this is the before, Bridgewater College. And what you see is you see the McKinney A Scholarship for $20,000. You see an out-of-state incentive for $3,000, a diversity grant for $2,500, Pell grant for $4,365, and an SEO grant for $600. Now, most colleges, that's that would be a great offer. We would just say thank you. But we really felt that based on the, the child's academic strength and based on what we've seen from this college in the past, there was a chance for more money. So we coached mom and dad and the student on how to appeal the offer. So if you turn the page, you'll see the uh, revised financial aid package for the same student. And the one difference is, well, is the Bridgewater General Grant. It's now 2100 from the initial 1200 So it's a $900 difference per year. Not that much, it's not a big deal. But if he keeps his grades up, he'll get a similar offer for years two, three, and four. So just for that one step in the process, that's gonna be $3,600 over four years that mom and dad don't have to pay out of pocket just because we appealed the offer. All right, so let's take a look at another example. Turn the page. Seattle Pacific, where we're just gonna review the free money. There's the ministry scholarship, and then two, two lines down, you can see the trustees scholar award, total gift aid, 18,500. Again, we thought there was more money, so we appealed the offer, and you'll see a revised award letter on the next page. This is uh, an email 
as you see the stars on there, you'll see there's now $3,000 more in free money per year. When you take a look at those two uh, awards, those two offers, $12,000 in savings over the four years just because we peeled the offer. So I also want to bring your attention to the special circumstances that they gave. It was a, uh, they gave it to them. They didn't even know what to call it. So uh, they just titled it special circumstances. Here's more money. We're not even sure why you're getting it, but here it is. And sometimes that's how it works is, you know, they, they, they'll find a way to just give you more money and find a different way to title it. All right, turn the page. All right, this is from Drexel University. If you live in the Pennsylvania area, it's, it's, it's a school maybe you're considering. Uh, this isn't a before and after, but I wanted to show you with Drexel, they awarded this particular student a $1,000 early FAFSA award just for filling out their FAFSA application and submitting it on day one that the window was open. So just because we helped the family and had their FAFSA answers ready to go on day one, they're now looking at it in an additional $4,000 over four years. All right, you can turn the page. Next example is from Yale. And we use this for a couple of reasons. One is because, well, it's the oldest one that we have. And we like to use it to show you it still works the same way as it used to. And number two, because everyone's familiar with Yale. Now, Yale's one of the colleges that will tell you that they don't give any merit-based money. They only give you need-based money, uh, and they're going to give you money to those kids who are the most attractive. So uh, here's the before, and you can see it's circled at the bottom. Yale scholarship, around $10,000, okay? Not a bad offer. We thought there was more money, thought we could uh, appeal to get it. So you turn the page, and now you see that that scholarship is over $15,000. That is over $5,000 each year in additional funding and over $21,000 over four years. Any idea what Yale University's endowment fund is worth? How about around $40 billion? And I can tell you, Yale University will not miss $21,000 over four years. Do you think you guys would miss $21,000 over four years? Would it be nice to save that money? Right. You know, it's uh, twenty one thousand dollars over four years. And, and another reason you could take that money, apply it somewhere, go on vacation, uh, maybe apply it towards your retirement. All right. So that's some good examples of, of, of getting money from the colleges and universities and why 75 percent comes from that source. The final source for money is the private sector. Now, the good news about the private sector, it's free money gift aid scholarships. The bad news, it's only 3% of all money that's offered every year. So we really don't think it makes sense spending 80% of your time going after 3% of the money. Now, the other piece of bad news is that a lot of the times it helps the school more than it helps you anyway. And here's why. Let's say a student gets an offer for $15,000 in scholarships and grants. Student's excited, right? Then they put in some extra effort and they win another $1,000 scholarship from, let's just say, the local Elks Club. Well, who do you think they have to report that to? The school. And guess what they do to that $15,000? They knock it down to $14,000. Well, when that happens to one of our students, we go back. We help the family appeal that decision. A lot of time, our students will get most, if not all of it back. So you're still ahead. Now, if that was the only college that you applied to, and they did that to you, do you think you have, you'll have you have any success getting any of that money back? I mean, you're, you're going there anyway. It's a done deal, right? So I think you can kind of see how it all works together, and you can see why you need to have six to eight, six to eight schools that would all be a good fit so you can put yourself in a position, position to succeed. All right, the biggest mistakes that you can make in the college process not starting early. I can't emphasize this enough. We encourage families to start when their kids are freshmen. It will give you better clarity when they are juniors and then seniors. Not filling forms accurately and on time. We will help you do that. Uh, not applying to a variety of colleges. Remember that number, six to eight institutions. Assuming you make too much money for aid, I kind of said that earlier. I've seen families earn as much as 250, 300,000, receive significant aid from colleges. 
Do you want to spend your money or do you want to save your money and spend the school's funds? That's the way you look at it. Finally, not knowing your SAI, a school's cost of attendance and how much need a school will meet. And we can help you do that. All right, knowing your student aid index number is the most important figure you will need throughout this process. And I can help you figure that out. Just go to this website, hireaccfs.com slash john dash borg slash sai and you'll find my simple sai calculator that you can use and that's going to help determine your sai number all right again not to sound arrogant but we don't work with everybody so students if you're not serious and if you're not committed it probably wouldn't be a good fit but for those of you that are looking for help i just want to review what we can offer, okay? We talked about the career planning and guidance, college search and selection help, admissions counseling, uh, campus visit details, when to go, uh, who you should interview with, what questions you should ask, we'll help you all do that. When does most families go or most students go during the summer? When's the worst time to go, go and take your campus visits? During the summer because it's not a realistic time and it's not an accurate representation of what campus life is like. So we want you to avoid the summer, but we'll, we'll help you guide your way through those campus visit details. Uh, I didn't really get into SAT, PSAT, and ACT test prep. Didn't get into this, but our program, the Naviance program, includes SAT, PSAT, and ACT test prep software that's as good as anything in the country. That is also included as part of our program. Professional assistance with financial aid application, the answer sheets for your FAFSA and your CSS profile, which about 10% of the colleges require that. Uh, that's an additional form. We will help you with that as well with a line by line answer key. Uh, the award letter evaluations and appeals that we went over, private sector scholarship assistance, the student aid report analysis, identifying your best educational values, answers that you can trust, and hands-on guidance and support. All right, for our services, we offer a base one-time fee, and that's it. That number is determined by your child's graduation year, the month that you enroll, as you can receive a discount during the slower summer months, and if you have other children in the program, as we offer a discount if you have enrolled with us before. As part of that base fee, we include um, a one hour, one on one consultation time. So if you need more than that one hour, uh, it's an additional $135 an hour. So the base fee, and then if you need more consultation time, and that's all that you'll ever pay to be part of our program. So what's your next step? Well, reach out to me. You can do it by phone, or you can send me an email at John at collegefundingsolutions.org and we'll set up a qualifying interview with the family and the child and from there we'll determine if it's a good fit for you and it's a good fit for us. I hope you've enjoyed this pre presentation. I'm John Bork. Please reach out to me if you have any questions.